Welcome to the MTD Podcast. I'm Giovanni Albanese, hosting today's show, a passionate engineer and a very proud member of the MTD team. Today, I'm privileged and really excited to be joined by the two founders of Fisher Smith Limited, a leading machine vision company. And I'm looking forward to find out how this technology can help with many automation solutions for all industries. Ian Smith and Bob Fisher founded Fisher Smith in 2004, combining their over 50 years experience of machine vision and industrial control systems. Ian and Bob have a love of solving difficult problems using leading edge machine vision technology alongside tried and tested techniques in conjunction with a variety of different automation systems. When machine builders and in-house engineers have a problem, they call Fisher Smith. So firstly, without further ado, let's introduce Ian. Ian has been at Fisher Smith for over 16 years and is widely recognized as a machine vision expert and software engineer. He was educated at the University of Bristol where he, he read engineering mathematics. Ian developed Fisher Smith's leading machine vision system, RoboViz and software, GenViz. Ian has taken a keen eye for digital, uh, a, a keen eye for detail and enjoys working with suppliers and customers alike to understand the requirements and deliver solutions. So welcome um, to, to the MTD podcast, Ian. Thanks for having us, Giovanni. Now, it's brilliant to have you on board, and I'm looking uh, forward to, to delving into uh, your business and your solutions. Um, so now let's introduce Bob. Bob. Bob has been at Fisher Smith for over 18 years and is also a machine vision specialist and software engineer. Before becoming MD, Bob served a MOD apprenticeship and worked for various companies honing his electrics and software skills before developing Fisher Smith's leading machine vision system, RoboViz and software, GenViz, with Ian. Bob loves to solve difficult industrial problems and delivers solutions that will stand the test of time. Bob's life outside of work includes activities um, as riding motorbikes, cycling, He's travelled from Land's End to John O'Groats on a tandem and hill walking. He is a qualified canoe instructor, regularly running ex expeditions to all parts of the UK and also plays in a folk band as often as he can. Well, that's one hell of an int introduction, Bob. Welcome to the MTD podcast. Cheers, Gio. I like keep myself busy. <laughs> you sound very busy, Bob, and uh, <laughs> and, and, and I, I believe uh, Ian, you've got a bit of a passion for football too. Yeah, yeah, my my playing days are sadly somewhat behind me now, but yeah, I uh, I, I do enjoy the football. <laughs> uh, did you did you used to play professionally or? Oh no, nowhere near that level. Just uh, yeah, kicking kicking balls and other people in the local leagues. That's, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> so guys welcome to the MTD podcast for our listeners um, in the UK and around the world can you firstly um, tell them before we start what machine vision is um, and what sort of problems it solves um, and if we can start with you uh, please Bob so machine vision is using camera technology to acquire images of, uh, of objects and, and making measurements within those images to uh, make a, 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 either an inspection or an identification process, either recognise a part or check a part is correct or wrong, and then uh, and then obviously give you the option of, of failing that part or or, or or picking up the robot or something. It's all about non -con non contact inspection at high speed, so it can operate at sort of you know ten parts a second maybe or or, or, or and, and far higher than that. But sort of the sort of thing you, you couldn't do either easy with a program system or with, or with manual inspection. Is, 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 is this the future for manufacturing, Bob? Definitely it is, yes. Yes, it's, it's, it's key, I think, uh, to, to get high quality. You know, nobody wants to be shipping rejects to, to customers. It's just bad business. And, and nobody wants to be adding, adding value to a part that's already, already faulty by further processes. So the sooner you can inspect a part in a process, the, the better, really. 
Right, so we're going to deep deep dive um, technically into the products in a bit more detail during this podcast. Now, how did you two meet and why did you decide to start Fisher Smith's, uh, Ian? Well, I was, when when I was at university, um, Bob was was, uh, working at a different company and uh, he found out what I was doing and and invited me to come along and do some, some summer work for that company um, and then I ended up starting my my business career uh, working for Bob at that company and then after a little while we decided to, to form Fisher Smith just to focus on the on the vision aspects more more directly um, and sort of never really looked back so Bob's got a, a so my, my career is very much vision 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 right from the from the word go um, whereas Bob started, um, he could probably tell you better than I can, more in the in the machine tool and the CNC areas, doing control systems, and then as the machine technology was was coming through, then uh, the, the vision technology was coming through, then Bob picked that up at a very early stage and started using it. Yeah, that's interesting. That is because you know our listeners are predominantly from the CNC sector, um, you know, metal cutting industry, and and automation really. It was we've been really slow to embrace it in the UK. I think that COVID has, has certainly changed that, and um, and we've started to see uh, people investing in automation finally and seeing the value. Bob, you know, vision was pro- you've probably got into vision before before it's time really yeah i've used many many technologies before they even had a name <laughs> tell us about your, your background a little bit then bob so i, I started with a, a work at a royal air class establishment um in, in and i got into winter 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 instrumentation and winter control systems model model positioning in winter tunnels. and um, and when i left left there i went to finish up working at a machine tool company that was making um high speed routers for the aerospace industry, for, for, for um, honeycomb materials, laser laser cutters, uh, very much in the early days of laser cutting, and uh, also knife cutting. And I developed several control systems that were the one available from CNC, standard CNCs at that time, I had to write my own control systems software to control axes that, that couldn't be controlled by the CNCs at the time to do various tasks. And, and, that, and that's how I, I stumbled across vision as, as a means of, of controlling positioning of, of, of cutters in, in, in material for trimming and identification. So the first first thing we did, did was looking at uh, digitising cow hides for the Jaguar car seats. And, and, what, and is this when you identified the potential for vision across many more sectors? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was clear to me, even at that stage, it's back in the 80s now, that uh, this, this was clearly the way to go uh, and a good career, career, career choice for me to, to follow, really. So, for our listeners again, if you want to find out a bit more about Fisher Smith as a company, you know, are you active on social media? Where can people find you? Our website's the probably the best place to start, which is fishersmith.co.uk. Um, but we're also um, LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, you can find us, and I think you'll probably have links uh, accompanying this uh, as well, or on your website. Brilliant. Here. Now, in, in a world of technology, um, and, and when technology has never been as important as it is today, digitalization, Industry 4.0, automation, it's been around a long time, even Industry 4.0 has been a, around for such a long time that people didn't really know what it was. Um, how do your products, or where do you see your products helping companies um, succeed? The the obvious and main application has always been uh, quality inspection, which has tended to be an end of line process. So you make the, the the widget, complete manufacturing of it, and then pass it under a camera to stop any rejects going out to the customer. But that's only part of the part of the story, really, because you've got the fact that the the data, the quality data you're generating in that. Uh, end of line point um, should really be fed back into the process to then allow you to um, to, to optimize the process to stop the failures coming out in the first place. 
Uh, and I think that's that will become more and more prevalent as more of these devices are becoming easier to connect up with with the sort of industry 4.0 that we're seeing. Uh, but we're also seeing as our the technology in our area uh, matures and becomes more affordable, it's now easier to deploy it earlier on in the processes. So rather than just inspecting the final assembly of the final product for you know all attributes at the end we're seeing a no fault forward uh, approach being followed more and more where we have maybe a simpler inspection for maybe a single attribute earlier on in the process because if that's wrong there's no point in adding more value to that component as it goes through the the remaining uh, processes of that of that um, manufacturing um, system so we're starting to see those cameras getting smaller, more self-contained, sometimes you know cheaper, but spread out through the the manufacturing process much more. Uh, so we're capturing bits of data at the the key points. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's yeah, some really good points there, Ian. I mean, if you can't if you can't check it, you can't make it. And I think that automated inspection is is certainly uh, something that's extremely important, you know, for high volume work. But it, it's not just the inspection or automated inspection of, of parts that you can do, is it? You can actually, um, you know, your vision system, If say, for example, you've got parts on a conveyor um, and they're just chucked on there in all different orientations or you've got parts in a bin, your uh, vision system can help the robot pick the parts out without them having to be in a in a kind of gantry style kind of format absolutely and um this is somewhere where we're seeing more and more of this um coming along again as our technologies in our industry have, have improved um things like random bin picking where you've maybe got a, a stillage of of parts that have been maybe cast or partly manufactured earlier on in the process sitting there and they now need to be fed into some other uh, process a finishing machine or a printing system um, milling or turning operations um, we now have three systems that are capable of scanning that bin of parts detecting which components are available to be picked on the top of it uh, looking for which ones would cause the robot uh, collisions to, to come in and ignoring those ones. Uh, and that's now becoming a, a, a viable technology. But that really has only matured in the last, um, I guess, five years, really. That that's now um, not just a sort of academic dream to be able to do that. Um, whereas... In the past, we've needed a bit more mechanical intervention, and sometimes that's still the, the appropriate course for these things. Um, and Bob's, you know, got a, a lot more history in some of his um, main projects he's been working on in the past were around our RoboViz products, which uh, was designed to help robots pick parts from conveyors. Um, so maybe Bob, do you want to say a bit more about? about rovers and those solutions that we solved yeah so you know we started with um you know looking at bowl fed systems for a bigger place with, with, a, with a lot of with a, with a fixture for every part type so you know you have a, you have a common bowl maybe you need a different set of fixtures to, to get get the parts out of the bowl and into, into a form where the robot could pick them up so the, the first task was to get rid of all those fixtures so the, so the machines could change over different parts much much quicker uh, so we developed, developed robots with that, with that in mind. So it, it can recognise a variety of different parts. It can recognise which way up a part is. So if you're feeding a part into a machine, it needs to, it needs, it needs to be a certain way around when, when it's presented into the CNC jaws. Then uh, we developed a software to, 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 to identify which way around it should go, even from a rough casting. Um, and, and, and so then you, just, you, just, you, you, so you, just, you still need a bowl to get the parts out in single file, maybe, because if there are parts that were tangled together, wouldn't lend themselves to pin picking, so maybe they can be bolted out into a single single file or a tray of bring it bringing down a pan of work at a, at a time, maybe. Uh, so yeah, so we developed that, and we developed a system that, that, that could could pick up the uh, 
where, 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 where parts are on the belt and work out which is the most efficient pick cycle to get the ones that you, again, that don't cause collisions and the most efficient use of the, of the, of the available conveyor time and, and, and part, part present, present presentation. I mean, this is a bit of a game changer, isn't it, Bob, in, in, in regards to being able to do that, in regards to the, the, the time that you will save, um, the simplifying of the process. You know, I mean, the, the, the saving of all the special fixtures and jigs to evolve these parts and um, it, it's completely transformed automation or, or, you know, there's still, you know, it's taking automation to a, a completely different level is what I'm trying to get, get at. You know, it's simplifying it. Is that, is that the case? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, and it's all about you know, sort of changeover as well. You don't, you don't need, you know, you have got a day set up to re, rejig a, a set of bowl feeders to to get to, to to run a different type of part. So you're you're able to run lower volume batches, more efficient, more efficiently with, without without any intervention. And, and that's another question, really, that I, that I add on my list. Really, you know, there's such a massive misconception that automation is only for high volume work and if you're doing low volume or medium volume it's not for me it's not going to help my business ian is that is that true uh to, to an extent there, there is some truth in there um but that's becoming less and less the case as, as we go forward so i would say historically the sweet spot for investing in in a vision system would be you know, continuous production of the same type of products. And then, you know, like any automation, it warrants investing good money in that automation to get a really efficient process to, to, to bash out those, those parts. But like Bob was saying, what we do see is if your tooling change is software, so the vision system's changing over, we're recognising some different parts and it's giving some different coordinates to the robots, then your change over time drops right down and that does allow you to run smaller batches because, okay, there's a bit of overhead in setting up the vision system to check each given part type or, or identify each given part type. But if that changeover is just a button click on the screen or reading a barcode to, to switch it over automatically, then that does uh, facilitate the, those, those faster batch changes. And we're also seeing with... Um, with the maturation of, of the products and in our industry that as we're getting to the you know maybe slightly lower price points with some of the some of the cameras and some of the inspection systems then the overhead to investing in those for smaller batch runs or more um, you know, lower volume processes it is not is no longer a, a concern as much of a concern because it can help and augment uh, a human inspection. And and the big benefit the vision systems has always been that they are totally objective. There's no subjectivity with them, um, which we've seen you know, examples of before where uh, customers have have had manual inspection. And the inspectors swear blind that the parts are good, but the vision system says that they're that they're not. Um, and we've we've had it proved in the past that that the, the operators are, and inspectors are very good at spotting an anomaly if they're presented with a bunch of good ones and a, a failure within that. But if all the parts are consistently looking the same, but they're all bad, they don't spot the difference. They just see them all looking the same and assume they're good. Um, whereas the vision system will be set up with given parameters and if the parts don't conform then the vision system will reject them it doesn't matter um, you know what what they're surrounded by what the preceding one two five twenty parts were the vision system will make the same decision every time yeah i mean that's that's a great answer and um I mean, I'm going to go on to Bob in a second, but I mean, effectively, just to try and summarise what you're saying here, um, Ian, is, 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 is like you mentioned previously and alluded to previously, you can kind of detect an error before you add even more vol value onto the part, especially with some of these really complicated components that are worth a lot of money. The last thing you want to do is, is, is add more value, do more machining to that part. 
you can automate high or low volumes in a in a more cost effective manner um, and ultimately you know you can start automating lower volume work as well as high volume work and create unmanned running um, overnight so you can double up your shift and keep them spindles um, turning Bob I know you wanted to say something can 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 you uh, let us know your thoughts on this yeah, I was just going to say that looking at the justification for, for an inspection system on a product is, is kind of this, there's three ways of looking. You, know, you might have a high value part that needs to be right. So you can just, although it's low volume, it's high value. So that, that could justify inspection. You could have a low value part, but you're making millions and millions and millions of them. So you don't you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, want because if, if, you know, if you make a, a tough one, let a tough one go through, you can get recall problems from, from, from your customers. When you've got to do manual inspection of thousands of parts, maybe on in another country, so I think there's no justification for making sure the parts right. And then in some cases, it might be a cheap part, where it goes in in the final assembly, it means a failure could cause a really expensive problem. So you, you imagine a washer in a gearbox, so that washer fails, it's a gearbox stri- stripped down. Well, we don't have any tuppence out of your part, but it's going to cost a very expensive re- um, recall and rebuild. So there are, there are many 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 ways of justifying the inspection. Uh, costings um, beyond just high volume and low volume. That's a, that's a really good point. Uh, well, very good points. And, you know, so in your opinions, you know, what are the barriers to entry to m- machine vision? What barriers to entry do you come across out in the field? So some of that um, we see, so, so some of it is is expectation driven um, that people see uh maybe what your, your camera can do or, or or what the sort of current state of the art of um google self-driving cars or something like that can be and they say well i can see this defect therefore i can inspect it and um, it must be dead easy but actually to make that a, a reliable and repeatable process which is what you want for an industrial inspection may present some some other challenges um the other thing that we that we often see is is part presentation that if you're looking to make a very accurate uh, inspection of a part you need to present it um, to the camera as reliably as you um, as you want to inspect it or or even more accurately you need to present it to the camera than, than you need to inspect it so the transport mechanisms the holding the handling um, of the part to present it to the camera can also be a, a key aspect uh, and I guess this may be a, a point to sort of add that that this is where we tend to like to work with um, machine builders and, and machine manufacturing companies who are maybe experts in, in the part handling. They're experts in the, in the moving and holding of the parts. And we can work with them and bring the, the vision expertise to that. And it tends to be a very collaborative process how we work with with our customers to ensure that collectively we get the best out of out of the vision system um, as part of the automated um, process. Yeah, so that, yeah, I can see the benefits in that that, that collaboration. How how important um, is the lighting? You know, you know, could could you does the lighting play a part in in, in the vision? The the, the lighting for, for a camera system is our source of information. So imagine that a camera can't see anything if there's no light on. So controlling the lighting is probably the single most important aspect of any vision system. And often a bit that's overlooked in uh, in preference to some of the camera manufacturers selling how whizzy or shiny their new camera is, what fantastic software tools they have, but if you haven't presented the data right, you haven't got that um, consistency of lighting in the first place, then your ins- inspection is likely to to always um, struggle with that because you're not necessarily just looking for changes in, in the presentation or how the part looks and how the defect may look on that part. But you're also having to cope with the fact that the lighting keeps changing. The sun's come out, the sun's gone away. They switched the, the light on overhead. Somebody's shining a, an inspection lamp into the system. 
and suddenly you've got glare on a on a part uh, and this can become um particularly important certainly with machined parts because often they are very reflective very shiny parts and uh, we had a system well, probably 10 years ago now that that ran for five or six years absolutely perfectly never missed a beat we had a camera on the outfeed of a, a CN, cnc checking for um a fairly simple check just checking for swarf have, having been wrapped around um the end of the part and not not being cleaned off in in the process um because they went straight to the customer off the, the back of this machine and that machine ran absolutely perfectly for five or six years um, picking out the odd defect that they had and then they rang us up one I think it was a, a February day and they said we're getting high levels of reject there's absolutely nothing wrong with the parts what's what's happening um, and we were able to, to to assess the fact that the machine was just happened to be where a skylight was in the factory and being the factory in Wales they didn't often see sunshine in February but this February that they had a clear sunny sky and the light was shining in at such a low angle straight through the skylight and almost perfectly illuminating the part and that extra reflection from the sunlight just caused the part to look completely different and we were rejecting them Wow. Um, so the remedy was fairly simple. It was we, we had the vision, the lighting was already in the system, but it just wasn't shielded from strong ambient light. So the, the, the answer was fairly simple. The customer put a little um, metal cover over the, um, the camera area and the problem never occurred again because now the lighting was constrained to just the light that we had alongside the camera in the system and it, it was fine. So... Yeah, we're also aware that um, although a, a complete enclosed black box is the ideal for the camera system because that's blocking out everything, um, any other uh, light interference, often when customers are having these vision inspections, it's part of a process that, that they, they either need to see for operational reasons or even for commercial reasons that when the, the MD comes around with, with some new customers and they say, look, here's the automation we've invested in. Isn't it fantastic? Look through this window, all the, the super technical things it's doing. Um, they like to be able to do that and not have it, well, inside this black box, something magical is happening, but you can't see it because the vision system needs it. So there are ways we can protect systems and still give visibility in uh, so, so that we can get around all those things. Yeah, so it's it's, um, it's it's again raised some fantastic. Uh, you've enlightened me, uh, <laughs> Ian. And, uh, Bob, now like for our listeners again, you know that that are listening to this podcast. Yeah, you know, does your technology check the parts as as kind of a comparison, or does it check the parts dimensionally too? Does it give you kind of a report? What information does it give um, to a potential client? Uh, just well, really, however you want it. I mean, a lot of a lot of systems are systems comparators. We train it. We train it on a good part. Put some tolerances on it, and those um, those measurements will be tested against that 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 that, that, that known, known good part every day. Um, or we can make you know absolute measurements uh, for, for for parts that are maybe maybe not not the same size every time, but they make different sizes. We can measure what they are and report the sizes back. So it's 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 all of the above really. Yeah, so it's 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 flexible. Now, guys, what is the most surprising thing that you've been asked to do um, as as machine vision uh, experts? Bob, start start with you. Count salmon in a river. (laughs) Seriously? Seriously, I'm trying to recognise it's a duck's backside you're looking at, not a salmon. <laughs> and Ian, yeah, I mean it's it's the the more off the wall uh, products are always the the ones that that jump out because they're they're not sort of boring and trivial. We've got one at the moment where we're in um, we're counting insects, which is just completely different to almost all the other systems that we've we've put out there. 
but it's a, a technology that we're able to uh, to leverage now um, that we weren't before. So um, it's, it's a you know we we're using techniques now which are based on a, a type of artificial intelligence, a subset of that to allow us to to work with images and classify objects that that were hard to put a rule together to, to work with before. So traditional vision systems, you tend to be saying, I'm looking for a measurement or I'm looking for a presence or absence of a, of a feature by counting how many pixels or checking for a color or checking for a pattern or a shape. Um, but we've now got um, access to these deep learning technologies where you can teach products based on um, a number of good samples and then look for anomalies and defects. So that can be particularly good for, you know, objects where they are not a standard shape or size, but you can teach lots of them like insects or fish or, or food products, but also any products where you've maybe got um, a, a, a finish to them. So this might be, um variation in a powder coating or variation in a a, a, a a material finish or even a material grain if you've got um cutting marks that vary but you're looking for um defects such as um material changes uh corrosion things like that or even welding patterns and shapes um you can now we can now inspect those by teaching it a bunch of good products and saying, this is what a good one looks like. Tell me when it doesn't, doesn't look good anymore. Um, and, and that's, that's now quite a, a, a game changing technology, allowing us to look for all sorts of different um, products that, that we, we couldn't have done five or 10 years ago. So that, that really nicely leads me on to my final question, really, guys. Where do you see the future of, of machine vision? And, and do you see yourselves working more and more with artificial intelligence? And, and, and how far can it go, But Bob? I think, yeah, definitely. We, we will see more and more of these um, artificial AI-type systems coming through. Uh, I think more and more applications will be opened up as a result of it. And, um, and and systems will get easier to use and deploy, and there'll be a much greater take up take off within the, within the, the automation, factual automation in general. And I think you know, it's a, there's a necessity for that to keep, to keep costs down. Stopping rejects going out the door is going to be key. Yeah, I, th I think it's. Uh, I, th I think that, in my opinion, I think that uh, production and manufacturing, you know, um, sh uh, sh the, the inspection side of it should be looked at on as one complete process rather than the machine in the production and the inspection as as two singular uh, kind of processes. And I think with your technology and products, it does seem to bring the two together quite nicely. And I think we'll be seeing a lot more of them as standard in, 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 in machine tools. And Ian, just to, 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 to kind of wrap up this MTD podcast, you know, where do you see the future of, of machine vision? Well, I, th I think we're, we're, as Bob said, really, we're going to see this now. I think we'll see two two things. One is we'll see more of it embedded um, as part of uh, machines as they come through to, to get this no fault forward process that rather than having a, uh, a maybe a sensor or um, some sort of gauge or, or a, a, even just work instruction to how you set something up, we'll start to see uh, little embedded camera systems doing some of those checks automatically, uh, maybe quite specific checks, but but having those built into to machines, and people will start finding those, you know, without uh, necessarily realizing that's that's what they're doing. It's just saying it's good or it's bad, it's ready to go, it's not ready to go, right through to the other end where we're seeing you know more and more systems where. Um, we're able to leverage some of the um, technologies that are filtering down from from maybe more consumer um, areas. So some of the deep learning techniques, um, some of that is filtering down from from what you know software industry leaders such as, as sort of Google and Amazon are, are working on, 
and those techniques are, are, are filtering down and becoming industrialized and turning into to products that are uh, we're able to to deploy within a reasonable reasonably quick time frame at a reasonable cost but also have that reliability and longevity that industry requires yeah bob i think i think also we'll see see the uh, inspection kit being used within the process as well uh check checking tool tips checking the manufacturing process as it occurs so rather rather than looking at the product looking at the tools you're using to, to make the product yeah, it's uh, it, it, for me. I, I, I think it's absolutely unbelievable. I think that this new technology is is fascinating, and, and I can't believe that the, the the speed in which it's kind of evolving. Um, effectively, um, in my opinion, you're giving robots robots eyes, <laughs> um, and the AI is is giving robots a brain, and it is really really um, fascinating. But it's also scary um, at the same time <laughs> to a certain degree. Bob, Ian, it's been an absolute pleasure to have had you guys on the MTD uh, podcast this week. And to all our listeners, if you've got any questions at all about uh, vision machines and machine vision automation, uh, please contact Bob or Ian and they'd be um, happy to assist you with any potential solutions. Thanks for listening to this week's MTD podcast. And until next week, stay safe and keep tuned in. Thanks for listening to the MTD podcast. If you found value in this episode, please subscribe and leave a rating and review. Find more episodes on mtdcnc.com.